As nations emerged from a brutal Second World War, they did so in a very different reality, a nuclear world. Across the country, Britain was bolstering itself against a new enemy in a Cold War, and they headed below ground. Nothing had been done like it anywhere in the world. Dozens of innocuous-looking buildings hide entrances to what were once the nation's most important secret network. Every day, this was on alert. Equipped with the latest radar system and large operational bunkers, these layers were tough enough to withstand a nuclear attack. Higher pressure than outside meant that any radiation that had got in here couldn't get through these doors. Perched on the Isle of Portland on Britain's south coast is a modest stone farm cottage overlooking the English Channel. Portland has been a military island for hundreds of years. Henry VIII actually built Portland Castle to defend Portland Harbor. It has sustained a military presence ever since. This unassuming farmland was the ideal location for a top secret Cold War installation providing around-the-clock surveillance of the skies. And dotted around the countryside are strange, unidentified concrete buildings. To protect the nation from Russian military nuclear threats, the British government developed this advanced air defense radar system, codenamed Rotor. Sue Ilsley has run a farm on the land for the last 10 years. All of these concrete buildings back in the day of the rotary radar system would have had rotary radars mounted on the roofs. They're now being used as animal shelters. Rotor stations were radar lookout posts linked to above ground equipment for scanning the skies 24 hours a day, seven days a week. When the rotor radar systems were built around the country, the threat to the UK from the Soviet Union was really real. They wanted an early warning system for nuclear bombs from Russia. Sue holds the key to one of these vast subterranean military relics, lying forgotten deep below her farm. There's a 400 metre long rotor radar station bunker under the house. Visitors that come to visit us at the farm and visit the animals, they would have no idea what they're actually walking above. Other than Sue, few people have ventured inside for more than 60 years. There's no public access to the bunker. Until today. First time that I came down here, I just imagined that it wasn't very big. When you get further into the bunker, you'll just see the immense scale. This is the first time anyone's been allowed down to film. These are the blast doors that would have been closed to totally seal off the bunker. This was the main control room. You can imagine people sat at desks with transponders, typewriters, listening for signals, looking at radar screens. Above ground, the rotor radars scan the sky for approaching threats. They were connected underground via cables that sent the signals down all the way back to the operations room. They were dug deep down and disguised above ground, so they didn't become obvious strike targets. 25 rotor stations were built all around the coast of the UK. In Essex, located 185 miles away, is the site of another secret rotor project bunker. And this one had an explosive purpose. Every day, the Russians were sending their Russian bears over to test our boundaries to see how quickly we could scramble our aircraft. Every day, this was on alert. Situated on Britain's southern coast was a top secret first line of defense during the Cold War. Its sole purpose was to detect approaching Russian bombers and prevent a nuclear Armageddon. Kelvedon Hatch was the central rotor station for Greater London and used as a regional government headquarters. 
If under a nuclear attack, the bunker could hold hundreds of military and civilian personnel for up to three months. In a mandatory land acquisition deal, the government bought the 25-acre site from farmer Jim Parrish in 1952 to build a three-story underground defense system. It was common knowledge it was here. What actually went on inside was more the secret bit. They told the locals that it was an underground water reservoir. Jim's grandson, Mike Parrish, has spent years restoring this rotor station to operational condition. The bunker is built 125 feet underground, and like the Portland bunker, its entrance is through an ordinary looking house. The ceiling is two foot thick concrete. All the windows are shuttered with metal shutters and a big metal door. When you're coming down the road and looking up through the trees, you can't even see this. It was fairly secluded. They, of course, got the compound around it. The guards were here. They had Alsatian dogs protecting it. From within the modest house, the true scale of the underground engineering becomes clear. If you've never been here before, you would be quite surprised probably to see this long 120-yard tunnel. It's constructed of concrete, obviously, as the hold of the bunker is. Engineers designed this immense structure to withstand a 25 kiloton bomb half a mile away. What you see here is the 10-foot uh, thickness of the walls. These steel rods are just reinforcing rods uh, to make the concrete stronger. It also needed to survive the enormity of a nuclear explosion. They put sand and gravel to, so we shaked if a bomb had gone off rather than uh, be solid. They then put a mesh around the outside to protect the sensitive equipment in here from the electromagnetic pulse which wipes out anything electrical. Should a bomb go off, the bunker would absorb the force of the explosion in order to protect the doors. These are the blast doors. They're quite hefty. They each weigh about the weight of a small family car. The tunnel has done a dog leg, and that's so that the blast coming down it would hit there and revert back and then hit here before putting pressure on the blast doors. This is the main stairwell. You can see that we're about 100 foot underground where we're standing. It's on three levels. The bottom level has the communications and the life support. It was deemed to be the safest being the bottom, so if everything collapsed on it, this would still survive. Now closed off from the world outside, the rotor operators could get to work watching the skies from under the ground. This is the plotting floor. There was a 24-foot plotting table here to identify where the Russians were coming in. The primary threat was the Tupolev Tu-95, codenamed Bear, a large four-engine turboprop-powered strategic bomber and missile platform. You had to react quickly. Every day, the Russians were sending their Russian bears over to test our boundaries, to see how quickly we could scramble our aircraft. Every day, this was on alert. How the top secret team tackled their mission was rather surprising. Triangulation team were fed information from outside radio points. And they would have a table uh, with a bit of string, and they would pull that string out and lay it across that bearing that they'd been given. They'd get another bearing from another radio station, and they'd pull out a bit of string, and hopefully they got a third one. That was where the triangulation was. That's where the aircraft were. Communication between the 25 rotor stations was of paramount importance. The teleprinter was the main form of communication. You typed your message, but when it came out the other end, it came out as a message with holes punched. And that was then fed into a reader and printed out. This communications network connecting the stations across the country was way ahead of its time. They had a system called the chicken wire system. If you wanted to talk from uh, Horsham up to, say, uh, Preston, well, you'd do so via Coventry. But if a bomb had gone off on Coventry, well, obviously, you could make your way round and still get to the same place. The prototype communications network would later provide the infrastructure for the early internet. We had that, the Americans had it, and the Europeans had it. And that's why the World Wide Web was able to get up and running so quickly. The Cold War became a catalyst for an explosion of technical innovation. 
with each invention outdoing the last. The rotor system was built to spot these missiles coming over from Russia, and nothing had been done like it ever before anywhere in the world. Civil defense technology was evolving fast, and the rotor project couldn't keep up with the Soviet Union's nuclear capabilities. Technology overtook the rotor system. It was the big white elephant of its era. By the mid-1950s, the more remote rotor outposts like Portland were becoming obsolete. And soon, some of these stations were forced to shut down. The rotor system had a very short life. It was slow and cumbersome by the time the information had been received, then sent it all off to the airfields. The Russians had traveled at 500 miles an hour. The whole rotor system throughout the country closed down in 1959. That wasn't because of lack of threat from the Cold War, it was because the system just didn't work. However, the Kelvedon Hatch station near London remained fully operational for nearly four decades, only being decommissioned in the 1990s. 